I have taken this to heart and I agree. He's like, I wonder at what point in my career I don't wake up. Like, I gotta go to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go like, oh my goodness, someone's called my clients. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. run out the door. I've done that before yeah. where I like, uh, sometimes I just don't even have the time to shower. I'm just. But that's that's yeah. what's so exciting about this yeah. job is. It wakes you up. Yeah, yeah. I would rather that any day of the week than an hourly wage where you know what's gonna happen every single day and it's yeah. just monotony. Like, I. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library Podcast. Today we are with four brokers, and you're a broker too, so or five brokers, five brokers. Um, so at, from Colliers, Avison, Gemreal. So uh, why don't we go around the the circle, the semicircle, and Hawk, if you can, Matt Albertine, if you could introduce yourself. Yes, uh, my name is Matt Albertine. I'm an industrial broker for Colliers International. Been in the business for about five years now, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm originally from uh, Oakville, Ontario, but uh, currently reside in Queen West, uh, downtown Toronto, and in the Etobicoke office. So pass it on to Tom. And I do a lot of deals. Lots of deals. Hey guys, my name's Tom Clancy. I'm with Avis and Young Commercial Real Estate. I've uh, been in the business for probably close to eight years now, and uh, loving every minute of it. Were you an author before that? I was not an author. I knew that was going to come up at some point. I still don't have a retort for that, but yes, no, not the original Tom Clancy, the new and improved. Just yeah. wanted to confirm, yeah. get the copyrights uh, lined up. Yeah. Um, for if you don't know, I sell apartment buildings at Collier's. I've been there for almost five years. Coming up on five years, if you include when I was a junior, and uh, yeah, that's me. Uh, my name is Garrett McGilvery. I am a co-host of CRE Library, but in the uh, off time, I uh, do commercial real estate finance. I uh, arrange mortgages, debt, equity for uh, all those, all the commercial real estate properties out there. Perfect. Uh, Sam Hall. I'm at Collier's as well. Um, I'm in the Toronto West office. I've been at Collier's for about seven years, and I focus on uh, redevelopment properties, so sites throughout the GTA that have a higher and better use for residential redevelopment and um, I just want to say I've been a big fan of the podcast since day one. <laughs> yeah, me too, and, actually. You know, I'm really excited, excited to finally be a part of it. Yeah. Hope that, hope that wasn't work. too formal. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. He's the only one who hasn't seen it. Um, <laughs> uh, Hawk, why don't, we do, why don't we start with you? Uh, Matt, his nickname is The Hawk. We'll get to that. Can, can you tell us about, like, how did you get into the industry? How did, like, everybody has these kind of weird ways of how they got into commercial real estate. It's kind of this hidden industry in a lot of ways yeah I knew nothing about it uh, growing up my parents moved a lot uh, so I was always in the car uh, looking at residential properties so I was interested in real estate but I never really thought about making a career out of it and then Collier's offered a summer internship program so I did the four-month summer internship program at the uh, Toronto West office and I just uh, kind of liked it and liked the corporate culture of things so after the summer, I kind of approached management and I said, hey, is there an opportunity to work here? And they said, well, go back and get your degree and get your license and we'll see what we can do. So then just kept in touch with uh, Collier's and then one thing led to another and we're here today still, somehow. Okay. Um, I don't know if we want to, do you want to talk about your, it's been a minute for you. Yeah. Uh, my origin story is kind of interesting. Uh, I've always been in sales. I love sales. I don't care what it is. I started off with gym membership sales. Uh, I used to live down in Australia for three years, and, and that's when I really got a, a taste of sales, doing, uh, doing and organizing parties for a living. So I used to sell party tickets. Yes, I'm free to admit that on here. Uh, I used to sell party tickets for a living, more or less a promoter, but I'm telling you, nothing will prepare you for commercial real estate and rejection, like trying to approach complete strangers on... Uh, the strip of surfers paradise in Australia where you know no one and you just got to walk up and start introducing yourself and try and sell something and I actually credit that experience for a lot of my success and being able to pick up the phone and just not really caring about what other people think just doing what needs to be done and that's that's really what this business is all about going out there and getting the business and having the confidence to make mistakes yeah. so that's my origin story for sales 
when I first got there, I was 23 years old looking at everyone doing this. And there was 28 year old guys doing this still at that time. And I said, no way. What are these guys still doing that? I don't want to be one of those guys. All of a sudden I was turning 25, 26 and I was like, my God, I got to get out of here. So my sister works at a company called uh, Hayworth, which probably most people would be familiar with. She sells office furniture, outfits, offices downtown Toronto. She works with a lot of commercial office brokers downtown Toronto. And she said, hey, why don't you get into the business? I think you'd do great at it, sales orientated. So I went out, interviewed at uh, all the major shops out there and ended up at Avison. Um, unfortunately, I did not end up in office leasing for my sister, so she still uh, holds some sort of resentment to me, I think, for getting into the business and going towards the industrial side. She's still waiting for that referral on the big office lead for... Uh, Is she in office, you said? She's not in office. She sells office furniture. So um, if anyone's looking for office furniture, this is my plug to my sister, Nicole Clancy, at Hayworth. She can help you out. Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know you sold uh, flyers in Australia. Yeah. Yes. Was it the uh, club promoters that said no or the girls? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to get into those conversations here. This is a professional podcast. Move it so. along. Um, I actually, so I can relate to like just getting shut down all the time. Uh, not from the ladies, but um, <laughs> but, but when Ooh. I, so, so I actually... Um, when I got out of university, I went to Western and I, I went to Ivy and for some reason I, I was obsessed with this, like, I got to be an entrepreneur, I got to do my own thing. All my buddies were going into accounting or consulting or finance. I was so not excited to do that. Um, and I started my own, like, basically it was a power washing company, like a simple business, you're knocking on doors going through that. And then the summer ended and I ran out of money and my mom's like, you got to get a an actual job um, and I couldn't find anything and I did, I'm not like insanely well connected or I wasn't at the time um, and and I actually ended up working at this door-to-door -door sales HVAC company and you, you talk about getting run down and shut down people like I knock on a door and you're like I mean I'm like, especially five years ago I was pretty innocent you're like hey I'm from simply you know I, maybe I'll bleep out the name, but I'm from like this company. And, uh, and the guy looks at you and he's like, you should be f ashamed of yourself. So I slam the door. <laughs> and so, and so, you know, a couple of years, actually I was only there for like six months, but then ended up getting my real estate license and got hired on the, the capital markets team at Collier's. Um, but you're inevitably cold calling and it's like, it's a lot easier than that. <laughs> like, if you're thinking about getting in the business, I would highly encourage you to go out and try a summer job doing door-to-door -door sales. Yeah, like get I, yourself, I agree. Get yourself prepared for rejection because there's going to be a lot of it. <laughs> and wouldn't you guys say that you have a better appreciation for people that do that now that we do what we do? Like a s <sighs> maybe, maybe not door-to-door, -door, <laughs> but sales in general? Or at least you, you can respect the hustle. I'll give them the time yeah. of day. I normally will. If someone knocks on my door, sure, come on in. Come yeah. on in. I'll talk to them. I don't know. Why not? Six yeah. feet apart. I was, I was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just wasting time, eh? For well, you. <laughs> I don't know. You got. I. You, you remember it. You remember yeah. it, and sometimes it's interesting. And you know what? You'll learn something maybe from that person. Yeah. You pick up a little piece from everyone. I don't know. Yeah. It's good at too, Tom. Yeah. What about you, Garrett? Uh, my story is a little more, I guess, convoluted in some sense. Okay. Um, hacking into companies when you were. Well, I did that in university. Old. Yeah, but okay. you know. I, did, I took accounting in school, um, and then I had a job offer at Deloitte, but some of my friends that already got the job at Deloitte were working 13, 14 hours a day, and they didn't really want to do that. So the other job offer I had was at a real estate appraisal firm. So then I got into real estate appraisal, did that for two, three years in Ottawa, and then got really bored. So then basically I wanted to move to Toronto because my originally from Toronto anyways uh, and then I randomly applied to one job got one job offer and then went to Jones Lang LaSalle joined their debt capital markets team uh, that's where I started doing you know real estate finance debt and equity uh, a bunch of different entrepreneurial activities since then uh, from being a CTO at a private equity firm and then starting up a few of my own companies in the meantime from you know educational services to podcasts and then you know never wanted to get away from real estate so stayed doing you know real estate commercial uh, finance brokerage so 
Yeah. And now you own an apartment building in Windsor and soon one in London. Yeah, soon right. one in London. All right. I like it. Um, Garrett, by the way, so you guys, like, we almost do the same job as, like, a mortgage broker, but his, how he gets to prospect is, like, we just hammer the phones. Yeah. And Garrett has, he's, like, all strategy. Like, we'll send out 100,000 emails. I'm slightly humble, so I don't talk about myself very often. Okay, all right. why Dama is now elaborating extensively. Right, right. And yeah, why you're not in commercial real estate brokerage. Yes, it's exactly. different. Finance right. is a little different because, you know, people want to sell a building every like 10, 20 years, but, you know, you need a mortgage every three to five. Right. So everybody needs finance. So I'm not really restricted by industrial or retail. I don't need a specialist on that. I'm a specialist on finance. So my scope is much broader. And, you know, I can. Really sounds like he's like talking down to us. I don't know. <laughs> I feel like well, no, really it's like you guys are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you yeah. lost me and I own multiple companies. <laughs> I'm yeah, sold. Yeah, yeah. You, you guys yeah. are specialists, you yeah. know, in your particular fields, like apartments. Right. Where it's like, I don't need to be effectively. Because, like, the same lender will do an apartment that will also do an industrial building. Right. So it's just like, you know, I just need to know that lender and their guidelines so that right. I can, you know, assist my client best yeah. i can get off your high horse all right uh all right sammy how'd you get started yeah so i gotta bring myself back to 2013 um i was <laughs> i was laying low which is a play way of saying i was unemployed and i had a buddy who Re- uh, reviewing job office yeah kind of post university time figuring out what i wanted to do and i had a buddy who was at collier's and i sat down with him and, and learned a bit more about the business and how it works and i thought it'd be a good fit and i just who was uh, that by the way um I, I can't say. I can't say. They've, they've, they've since moved on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're a really good guy, and um, I got to kind of learn about the business from him, and I thought it would be a good fit. And, you know, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I think, like, the business offers financial freedom and flexibility, and I think work, there's nothing better than working for yourself and making money as, as far as a 9-to-5 goes. Um, Canadian so that, dream. Yeah, exactly. So that appealed to me, and... You know, still, uh, still trying to make it happen every day. <laughs> that boy. Um, can you? So, like, I, I think eventually we'll get to all the successes, and you know, all of us here. The reason that we have this collection is because, like, we all do quite well and did the young thing, but we're now we're we're getting there. And and thank you for Tom for for hosting us here in this backyard, by the way. Um, can but like, let's stay at the beginning for a second. Uh, Albie, can you tell us about? uh the summer of 16 can you tell us about a a time a time when maybe early in brokerage when you're still getting your bearings sure so i started in brokerage at 22 uh turning 23 so a young age to get started so there's some pros and cons to that um but the summer of 2016 i was working under a senior agent and uh we had a meeting in mississauga i was a few minutes late and uh (laughs) <laughs> I pull up and at the time to give you some background, I was driving a Mustang convertible, a uh, very loud car. So you could hear it from a mile away. And my senior broker, uh, I feel Oof, bad. What were you me. listening to at the time? Uh, Summer 16 by Drake. And it was full volume. Pulling who, up. who was the owner of the car? Uh, my father. <laughs> 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 this is before I, I had an Audi. Now I drive an S3. Not a big deal. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> With red interior. Is that also owned by your dad? And no, no, that's on my name. Thanks, Sam. But finance, anyways, finance is borrowing it the money to pay for it. But yes, <laughs> it's on a lease. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> depreciation costs. Anyways, back to the story. We're pulling up. We're going to meet this owner. We're really excited about the meeting. It's a second or third meeting. And I guess maybe I was a few minutes late and I rolled up. I had the aviators on the top down, you know, like I'm trying to feel confident, get pumped up for the meeting. But my senior agent was furious. He was he was not happy. I was late, to say the least. And uh <laughs> He said, why are you late? And I I held the coffee up. I said, it's dollar drink days. (laughs) (laughs) So that was a moment where, you know, you look back and you appreciate the guys that are before you and they, you know, put up with, you know, the maturity and the growing up in the industry. But it all worked out. We sold the building. We moved them to a bigger building. Everyone was happy. uh, And it was a great deal. But yeah, definitely a funny story. And it's been twisted and told about for years. So there's the truth. of the. It's a success story. Yeah. If you ask me. You guys, you guys in the West, like I, I came to the West office, uh, only like a year and a half ago, a year ago now. Um, but like the, 
I find the senior guys in the West to be so funny and like the way that the mentorship works, I guess it's in every single office, but like one of my favorite things is uh, one of our colleagues do an impression of like his senior broker at the time. And he's like, well, I don't know. I can't even use it. Maybe I'll bleep it out in post. He goes, he goes, he goes, <laughs> if I had a nickel for every shitty lead you gave me, <laughs> like talking uh, about a filler, by the way. Not, <laughs> not, 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 not yet. Not yet. But yeah, I got, uh, I got a good story. So when I started at Colliers, I had my first car um, was a, a Pontiac Wave. Which, if you don't know what it is, you can Google it. It's like a Geo. <laughs> it's a little four-door hatchback. It's with the size of a golf cart. And I used to get in that car, and I would bomb across the city to go meet anyone who expressed any kind of interest in meeting with me. If they told me they had a 20-year relationship with another broker and they had no needs, I would I would go and meet them. <laughs> and it's the right attitude, though. Yeah, actually, right not attitude. the worst strategy. But I was going to segue that into, like, you know, kind of mistakes <laughs> that, yeah, that yeah. you made and, yeah, you know, find. spending time on just, you know, ridiculous things, going across the city, spending half a day in the car, but... Right. Um, you know, I think we all we all made mistakes like that. What? So what's like? What's the furthest you've went to like to prospect? Do you Before think? you answer that, what's the furthest you parked away from a meeting with your Pontiac? That's what <laughs> I really yeah, want to yeah, know. Yeah. It was a standard few blocks around the corner, you know, <laughs> just some, somewhere out of sight for sure. Um, I don't, I'm not sure where the farthest I've been. The, the the craziest thing I've done while working on a deal, I was selling a, a property in Mississauga. And we had the environmental consultants come in to do a test, and they had to get to an area that was um, like fenced off with a, with a lock. And the vendor, it was kind of a, a weird dynamic. Like a couple of the family members didn't want to sell, so I'm at the property trying to get in with the environmental guys, and I'm calling one of the sons, and he's like, "I can't help you get in. Like, you know, not my problem, man." And um, so we ended up going to Home Depot, and we bought a pair of bolt cutters because, like, the father said we could do it. So we bought a pair of bolt yeah. cutters, and we cut a hole in the fence. And the environmental guys went in and did the testing. But it was all – it wasn't illegal. It was, you know, <laughs> um, the, 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 yeah. the vendor gave us permission. But, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's – Then you find out it's not his property. Yeah, I think it's – <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and you fill the truck uh, with whatever's in the, in the, in the store. But right. I, I think it's just like a whatever it takes kind of thing, you know. It's just yeah. – you, you live and die by the deals and – you know, whether it's just going to Ottawa for the day to meet someone or, you know, yeah. buying a pair of bolt cutters yeah. to, to move a deal forward. I think it's just, you know, whatever it takes. Yeah. What about you, Tom, when you started? Uh, God, talking about mistakes, there's a lot of them. Um, I, uh, I was fortunate enough earlier on in the career where Lindsay Hopps and Chris Wicken uh, brought me on an account with Great West Life. I'm still on that account on the Western Business Park, doing a lot of leasing out there, which was a great, great place to start, seeing lots of deal flow. But unfortunately, you get a ton of inquiries from groups that you probably shouldn't be running with, you know? But <laughs> you don't know that early on in your career, and you're willing to take on anything you can get. So I definitely uh, spun some tires running around with a lot of church groups oh. recreation oh, groups perfect. recreational groups you yeah. know those type of groups that you just unfortunately it, you, you can't easily do deals with those groups but I, I did spend a lot of time working with them in the beginning but hey you learn a lot um, probably my biggest mistake in my career which is now laughable but uh, I was with uh, the leasing rep at Great West Life very, very early on in, in my career stage. I think I was like three to four months in. And I did have my license, so I was touring a, a building with her. And at one point she said something about having to go home and plug something into the NER. And I, I'm the type of person, if I don't know something, I'm going to ask, you know? And she said, I got to go plug something into the NER, you know? And she's obviously talking about plugging numbers into the NER, right? I had no idea what she was talking about. I had no idea. I said, what's an NER? You know, asking that question. And that got back to everyone at Avison. And to this day, that still is something I get made fun of about. So, <laughs> And nobody's told you. Yeah, still to this day. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, still I was going to put on the spot so can you explain to the podcast what an NER is. Yeah, cool. no, asking for Albertine, what is an NER? <laughs> Quickly, though, we, we, we talked about Great West Life, great company to work with. have to uh, give them a quick shout out. Is that... Are you, were you the broker of the year at one point? Twice. <laughs> Whoa. Two-time Young Gun you Industrial Broker yes. of the Year, but great staff, great That's to work with. They've given Tom an opportunity. They've given me an opportunity. I think that's one thing I'll say about landlords and the industry in general is I think they recognize young people that work hard and just giving us you know, the opportunity to be on these listings or even these awards 
you know, it gives you recognition. So appreciate that. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I've sent those emails out to both Ian and Ian Flemington and, and Shannon King saying, you don't realize how much of a, a like, this is necessary for any young broker. If you can give them an opportunity to work on that small base stuff, you know, provided they're working with someone above them who's going to watch everything they do, that is crucial to, to the beginning stages. It's just about deal flow and getting those reps underneath you. So I'm still thankful for that account to this day. With all that's going on in the world right now, it's one of the few places where we're still doing deals. So And there's companies out there that, you know, they grow into larger spaces. That's one thing I learned in the beginning of my career is, you know, you do want to focus on certain square footages and asset classes, but if it's a good quality company, maybe they have a small division, maybe they're a European group that's going to grow. Like you know, there's tons of stories of 16,000 square foot tenants turning into 60,000 square foot tenants. Right. So maybe having a positive attitude, I think something I learned a lot from Sam Hall, I would say is a good part about the industry. Thank you. Is that a good segue into the Hawk story and how that, that name came about? Oh, let's hear it. Yeah, so it was at the old office, and Albertine had, had just started at Collier's, and he's talking about... Very high you know, cubicles in the old office. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But he was he was two cubicles over for me, so we kind of became buddies, and he was thinking about which area to prospect as a young industrial guy, which area to farm, so to speak. And uh, he's like, you know, I'm going to do Meadowvale. And he's like, I'd like you to call me the Meadowvale Hawk. <laughs> And I was like, well, you know, sure thing. And then we, I brought it up in the sale. I brought it up in the sales meeting that week. And then from then on, I, I think a lot of people don't even know his first name. I think uh, a lot of people just call him the Hawk, and it's a name that's stuck. And, it's and a pretty to give awesome it a little name. more context, that all that's true, but Sam doesn't play hockey. So the Meadowville Hawks are like a uh, minor hockey league team. So I would have just assumed he would have got the joke. Mm. Fast forward to the Oxford Cup, which is a great event put on by Oxford for all the brokerages they play this tournament. And I guess no one knew who I was. And I'm just buzzing out there, skating from end to end. And like, who is this kid on the Collier's team? And Sam's up eating oysters. And he's like, he calls himself the Hawk. So I'm trying to be like super professional at the after gathering. Introduce myself. Hey, I'm Matt Albertine. They're like, no, 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 you're the Hawk. And it literally, I can't shake it to this day. Like, but thankful for the nickname. And it's a funny story. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good handle. Yeah, didn't know that story. <laughs> now you do. Uh, one thing, one thing I'm always curious about. Maybe this is a tougher one to to answer. What, what's like the best cold call you've ever had? If if you remember something out of the blue, maybe it's like a line that that you use that just absolutely works. So you want like, us to give away our secrets? Is what you're asking us? Here yeah. Now that, that we're on this stage <laughs> and we can just edit this part out. <laughs> what what what's what's something that that has worked? Like I I know. A lot of the times, and this was true even when I was knocking doors selling HVAC, you would know if you were getting in the door based on how confident you were. And I, like I remember one of the first listings that I got was uh, the old Consumers Gas Building on, on Eastern Avenue, 415 Eastern. I had called the owner like a couple times, they're usually down in, in New York, and I called them one time and I basically, it was, it was as if they couldn't not meet with me, was how it was framed. It was like... Our Collier's is doing a lot of work across the street. Like, when am I coming in? And not in like a dickish way. I was no. a lot more polite than that. But that strategy like really worked. I think I met with the entire block, and that was that was back before I was doing multifamily. Um, and then we sold that listing for eleven point two million dollars. That was my first sale. Um, but like, what Good starting point? Yeah, not bad. Not it's bad. Been downhill since. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you're knocking industrial condos. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just. Just sold it. I, I can try and field the question. Two hundred million dollar apartment <laughs> portfolio, by the way. But anyway, I can try and field the question, and I think something that I learned from selling party tickets, or from selling gym memberships, or from I did door to door sales, or sales selling on uh, fixed price for natural gas and electricity. Everyone sells differently. Like everyone has a different way of selling. Um, so you ask the question, one specific phone call, or or maybe what the secret to it is. I don't know if this is more geared towards a younger generation watching this, uh, looking for tips or whatever it is, but my, my comment, my thought was, for your first six months of calling, think of it as just you're trying to make mistakes. Like, just go out there and be prepared to make mistakes. Just make the calls. Don't even try. Uh, Almost how many times can I get rejected? Can I fail? Just yeah. get used to the feeling of being rejected. Uh, after that, six month period I, I progressed into a different stage which was okay I, I now have a script or I feel comfortable or I'm calling off 
property that I know. So it changes a little bit, but I still, for the first two years calling and in the business, strictly focused on quantity, not quality, because you're still not, you don't have a, a brand recognition. Um, you don't have maybe necessarily listings that you're calling off of something that I did. And I think this isn't rocket science and maybe we're, we've all done it, but anytime a new property would come out listed on, on MLS, first thing I would do is pull up every single owner or tenant using Scott's list. I don't know if you're familiar with that guys, but we use Scott's list and it would give you a list of all the executives. And I would just call everyone on that street, tenant buyer or tenant owner, whatever it is. So it's, I think it's progression with sales calls. Uh, nothing really sticks out specifically now that, you know, you, you've got some years under your belt and you, you feel a little more confident on the phone or meeting with people. It's, uh, it actually comes pretty easy. So your first, first six months, just forget about it. Just pick up the phone and make those mistakes. The next two years, just quality, just meet, just get many, as many meetings as you can and then start focusing a little bit more later on yeah. in your years. I don't know if I answered your question. No, but I, I, I think that's a great point. And I, and I think like a lot of, especially the younger guys, when they're literally, when they're starting out, everybody is looking for some sort of trick. And usually it's not a cold calling trick either. Usually they're thinking, oh, well maybe if I just meet someone in, in person, maybe if I send a bunch of emails, like basically any excuse to get off of the phone. Yeah, for uh, sure. But that's the only way you make money it's just door knocking works as well i oh, still i still do, do no door knocking hard to do now. yeah hard to do now during what we're going through but door knocking is if you're working on a listing and your senior uh, has put you on it to do the work on it print off flyers and you get you need because 90 percent of the time maybe not 90 what would you say 70 percent of the time buyers are people in the immediate area it's going to be a neighbor it's going to be someone one street over looking in that area so Go out there and get it. Uh, and door knocking, it's much harder for someone to say no to you in person than it is on a phone. In the worst case on door knocking is that you get the business card of the person you are supposed to reach. Calling, I find, especially at the beginning, maybe you're not confident, but people weren't as willing to give you information. Now there's like, you know, sudden pauses when you're quiet on the phone. I notice like quiet silence is your friend. Mm -hmm. And someone just fumbles and gives you something maybe they shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. But like the beginning, I don't know, I found it difficult. so nervous to make the call that I would just practice it almost like pretend I was calling to like get the rhythm and timing down right. because I found that I'd just be like hello it's my and I'd just talk I'd talk I'd talk so then I started to like listen to the people around me and I would just like slowly almost like pretend hey Walmart like it's it's Matt Albertine from Collier's calling and then like wait and like think about what they might say and how I would respond and then eventually you know you obviously had to get on the phones but I think for the first you know at least week or so I definitely just practiced the timing that's a lot of it. It's not like like in the office in front of people pretending you were calling people? Well, we, we had the cubicles. <laughs> so, like, I was a sales assistant. So part of the job is to, you know, work with the senior broker. But there's a gentleman that sat beside me that made a lot of cold calls. So I would listen to him and literally just start to get the rhythm down, like kind of like tap my foot of, like, when I know to speak or how long to wait for silence. And I find that that, like, it really helped me be successful and more comfortable when I actually made the calls. Nice. Yeah. I know one of my favorites is when you when you continue the convert somebody hung up on you like midway through your talk your talk track and you just continue oh all right okay know what I'll, I'll call you back later all right perfect <laughs> just like, or you call them back and you're like hey sorry I think yeah 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 I don't know what happened no, we didn't. Like, yeah okay sorry but yeah at the end of the day I think like, you're just if you view it in this mindset that you're just reaching out to somebody people are pretty receptive if you call and you're, you're arrogant and you're rude, it, it's not going to work very well. Okay. But if you, if you just say, hey, I'm just reaching out, this is the reason, maybe not that exact wording, but that kind of attitude, I think people are more receptive to it. I don't know if you guys agree or not. I want to share, share one. I don't know if um, hopefully the microphone can pick this up. I, I just thought this was like, fuck, if I can find this thing. It's a live recording of a crash and burn on a cold call. It's a crash and burn uh, from one of my buddies. The voicemail that he got back was just like <laughs> mint. Uh, yeah. So I'm just trying to find it. But actually, just a body bag. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just yeah, a yeah, body yeah, bag. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And almost, you know, when, when you leave someone a voicemail or, or you call someone a lot and then they do finally call you back, you know, I'm sure we've all gotten caught off guard with, you know, the person we've called a hundred times, but we've never caught them live and they know who we are. But, you know, there's so many calls going outbound that you can't keep track and you have no idea why the guy's calling you and yeah. he's, he's just fuming. I think you just, you have to be relentless. And oh, you this can't is be it. Afraid Here, hold on. Hear no. I think this, this was like to know how you know my name and i would like to know where you're getting all this info saying is i'm selling a house by the way i don't live what uh, uh address you just said on the phone okay why don't you just fuck off okay bye <laughs> <laughs> that's just a classic usually it's not that's that bad brutal. yeah it doesn't like happen that aggressive <laughs> all the time but yeah we've gotten that you could just catch that you know guy not in the to back call day, them again. they're off your list uh, you probably still call them. yeah <laughs> uh, yeah you, you you can't be afraid to hear that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. you're going to hear no a lot and you can't be afraid to call someone multiple times a week or tell yourself a story that they don't want to hear from you on a Friday or well, and then you, you know, call whatever. them 6 months later and they love you. So it's you never know, right? It's timing. Uh, I would say that's a big learning. Like, oh yeah, don't call me. We're not doing anything for 3 years. Things change. If you don't if you listen to that, you don't call for 3 years, you're going to miss out. Can we can you talk about uh a stage when you like when you felt like you got it, like when your career went from, okay, we've talked about all this like really junior stuff, but when your career progressed and actually you were rookie of the year. Yeah, so maybe I was, maybe it was <laughs> off the jump, but. Well, I mean, I actually, I pivoted a bit of my career three years ago. I, I switched my focus to redub. So I, I'm still not there in my opinion, you know, I'm, I'm still slugging it out. Um, the same way I was six years ago. It's just a different, you know, cold call list and, you know, kind of a different game. Um, Why did you want to change? What made you change? I think you'll be able to know that. Yeah, no, I, I switched. So I did industrial for the first four years and then I, I switched to rehab. And the reason I switched was I didn't think there were a lot of brokers that were really good at it. Obviously, there are a number of guys that are very good, but I think it's a little different than some of the other asset classes like office or industrial where, you know, you have a very deep bench at a few different brokerages. Um, so that was one of the reasons. And I also thought there'd be a lot of opportunities. So I aligned with a good team and, um, you know, we're, we're making it happen and we're doing some, you know, some, some good deals and we're working on some very cool projects. But, you know, it's a long road. There are just more boxes that need to be ticked in the redev game as a buyer. Um, but we're slugging it out and, you know, on the phones every day. <laughs> so I, you know, I can't really right, answer yeah, your question you about how it feels to make it. All right. <laughs> okay, all right. Because I'm, I'm getting there. Hopefully soon. Maybe if we do this podcast in another year, I can be in your chair. But uh, maybe for now, I'm. I might be low man on the totem pole right now. No, no, no. no. Well, I was gonna say maybe quickly. Tom goes into his specialization in mine, and we can edit it. Okay. I, I mean, sure. Yeah. We yeah, didn't, anything we, else hockey yeah, you'd like to change about the, going yeah, the podcast? Just, I was just thinking maybe tell people, there's a lot of people that watch this in different, you know, positions across the industry. Yeah. And they should know what Tom Clancy specializes in. We've talked about what Sam Hall specializes in. Yeah. Okay. Damn it, everyone knows from the Cliffy Real Estate Podcast. Maybe right. talk about what you specialize in. Right. And then I'll go meet. Okay, so my focus is industrial, and I work across the GTA West. My office is uh, right across from Square One. So that's where I started, uh, again, working underneath a, a senior uh, mentor, Ben Sykes, at the time. And uh, we were working all across the GTA. Uh, I still continue to work all across the GTA, but now I found myself in a little more of a specialized area. It's not my only focus, but I would say probably about 50% of my business now is focused on the North York uh, Design District area. So that would be, for those of you not familiar with it, is the you know Lawrence and um, Lawrence and Caledonia, or Castlefield and Caledonia, or Castlefield and um, Dufferin, Tycho, Swingle. Those are some of right. the streets, and it's an interesting pocket. So that's that's kind of what I do across GTA. It's one sub focus of an area that I'm passionate about, but I'm anywhere from anywhere GTA West. Do you ever step foot in Meadowvale? <laughs> I I am f uh, very terrified of the hawk coming. There's a down. hawk there. <laughs> you don't want to walk <laughs> in a dark alley in Meadowvale and run into the hawk. No. No. Oh, you'll, you'll hear the Mustang from a mile away. <laughs> um, okay, well, in order to not make this like a two-hour podcast, yeah. maybe we'll wrap it up. We could do a part two at some other point down the line. Um, a couple more questions. Go around and talk about. And you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a huge story, but best and worst day in real estate. Worst day first, probably. Oh, jeez. Best day in real estate. <laughs> Whatever you want. 
Um, you know, the best day was probably my, my first redev deal that I did two years ago, just to kick it off. Um, you know, I thought it would take a lot longer and we double ended the deal and it was, you know, a lot of ups and downs. And when it finally closed, it was, you know, pure ecstasy. Can I say that? Yeah, <laughs> on, yeah, on yeah. The camera? <laughs> in one of the, one of the more weird comments, yeah. um, but it was pretty sweet. And, um, yeah, the, the, the worst day I, you know, I, I've, I've had a lot of them as I think a lot of brokers have, you know, it's a really tough business. And it's going to sound similar probably. Yeah. I, I think it's just a, a deal that I worked on for probably two years, this, uh, a sale in North York. It was a redev site and it just completely fell apart just like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was no chance of it ever coming back. And, you know, it just, it's always a dagger, but you know, I think it's also a lesson that, you know, you can't hang your hat on anything. Right. Um, you got to have a lot of a lot of balls in the air. For yeah, sure. you know, if you hang your hat on something, I think you're just setting yourself up for disappointment, and um, you know that comes with experience. But you know, I I don't know if I have a specific worst day, but that was that was a pretty rough time. I might say worst week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of lonely walks on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of soul searching. A lot of soul searching. What about you, Garrett? What do you got? Worst day. Sure. Well. Again, it's probably in similar um, strand to you, like the fact that you were going to deal for like three, four months, and then you realize that the owner um, of the particular portfolio that you're working on actually goes by a different name, and he might have <laughs> potentially forged his name in a lot of different paperwork, and you realize that he might have been affiliated with uh, certain groups that might not have been, you know, on the level effectively. And, you know, you, you have the deal signed up, you have commitment letters drawn, and then all of a sudden, one phone call, one angry lender yelling at you for some reason that you don't understand, for something that you didn't know about, and then it's all gone, disappears. Just in the drop of a hat, it's gone. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, best day. Well, best day is when you get a large check in your... Yeah, okay, account. all right, yeah. okay. They're all kind of similar then. Yeah. Um, I can try and give a different answer. Yeah, I, okay. I, I would say... When I my best day was uh, we have something as I'm sure you guys do is a leader re- leader report. I right? saw my client smile. And yeah, it was yeah. Just, <laughs> just, just <laughs> they were so it happy in their heart, space. You know? yeah. it their <laughs> no, I I came into the business and this cool report came out uh, like a m- month in being the business and it was the emerging leader report. Uh, just has all the names of the top brokers in your office, and it has the seniors and it has the juniors. And my goal was I wanted to be number one i wanted to be number one and that was my goal and i worked towards that for you know the first three four five years of the career uh so that happened whatever three three years ago it was and i finally reached that high mark on the totem pole and that was the best day and i i was just really proud a a proud moment but then it was also the worst day because shortly after that i got moved into uh the next level and now I'm yeah like, that's <laughs> the thing about brokers right <laughs> you know, it, gotta keep it, going it yeah. so now you're moved and you're competing with these you know monsters in your office um and you know but that's I, that's what the business is you, you you constantly it's a constant struggle so if you're not prepared for that you know don't step don't. on the field yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for me i'll go quick best day was someone finally called me and said, I want you to list my building. And it was a $10 million sale. And like people talk about this where it's like, you know, follow up, follow up. And one day they'll call you. And for years, never happened. But then finally I got the phone call myself and the guy goes, do you know who this is? I'm like, oh yeah. He's like, I want to see you today. I was like, today? I was out for lunch. I dropped everything. I, it was across the street, the restaurant across the street. I don't know if I'm supposed to say names. I literally was like, boy, sorry, I got to go sell a building. And I ran, you know, put together the package, signed it up, like, I don't know, the next week or something. But that was the best day for me. Nice. Yeah. Bought the Audi. The rest <laughs> is history. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. awesome. Dama, you? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, like... I've probably, probably my favorite day was like, I, I worked on this. This is when I was like just starting to get into apartments and I was working on this rooming house. It was a 23 unit building in like midtown Toronto. And just like, if you, it, I mean, guys who are in apartments would know this, but if you, you kind of like see how people live and it's like, it's in a rooming house, the, the rooms I think were like 80 square feet. Um, so like, wow. Like basically this big, like the size of this this little mat, yeah. um, 
and like I remember touring a guy through it and he was like holy I'm I'm out of here and he like he literally was looking down he's like there's a little powder on the ground and it was like roach powder <laughs> and there's like bed bugs there's like everything you could imagine in this Dude, property that tell, the me city of Toronto? tell me oh, yeah. uh, there's oh, that, that's Sunday. probably like 17 million dollars with the partial real estate yeah. today yeah <laughs> Um, Can you t tell me when you toured it, you had to look in e every, uh, e each room, like you had to look in oh, 80 yeah, rooms many times. you toured it. Many times, for sure. Yeah. Um, but selling that, that was like one of my first, uh, apartment sales, like by myself. Um, and that one was, that one was pretty special. Cause it was like a lot, there's a lot of times where it could have died. There was like, you know, some environmental testing going on. Every, people were freaking out. And you, and you kind of, you know, eventually you get better at doing that and recognizing the problems before they happen. But, um, but that was pretty special. And then worst day in real estate would just be like two deals dying on the same day. And then uh, a pitch that you were working on, you lose. And you like find that out on a Friday and you're like, oh, oh, this actually, so I found, I found that actually happened. And then I was getting off of the gardener, off of the DVP coming down Richmond and I got a speeding ticket. And on your worst like, day? And I didn't have my insurance in my car, so it was like the speeding ticket plus $300, and my bank account was like zero. <laughs> Are you remember, kidding me? I remember that. That's why you go to work <laughs> on Monday. <laughs> yeah, 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 you get that. back up on Monday, yeah. though, and you're fired up, yeah. man. You're going to hit the phones hard the next week. Yeah. Scraping yeah. the bottom. We'll, we'll have like, to do some editing. There. But Tom, you said something to me one time that I, I have taken this to heart, and I agree. He's like, I wonder at what point in my career I don't wake up. Like, I got to go to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, my goodness. Someone's called my clients. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. run out the door. I've done that before yeah. where I, like, uh, sometimes I just don't even have the time to shower. I'm just, but that's that's yeah. what's so exciting about this yeah. job is. It wakes you up. Yeah, yeah. I would rather that any day of the week than an hourly wage where – you know what's going to happen every single day and it's yeah. just monotony like i wake me up with a little bit of a heart attack and let's go right? yeah you have you have so much freedom you can you can make a lot of money you can make a huge impact which is really exciting i know um one of one of my buddies who works at a different shop he was telling me the other day that he he has a list of five names two of them are in his company and the other guys are like direct competitors in his market and he stares at them every morning he's like i'm gonna murder you all like an absolute psycho yeah, yeah. Like this guy's guy's style. Style. and he does yeah, very well style. he does the very well list. so is your friend yourself <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i might start doing that hey it's not about it yeah i have pictures of like my family and friends in my cubicle because that reminds me of like why i'm doing this job right yeah sometimes you need that extra motivation to get on the phones and you just look to your left you see your sisters your fam and you're like no i want a good life for them and myself and right Helps, it's, it's, helps you get up. It's such a proactive business that you got to do whatever you can to motivate yourself. Yeah. You know, whether like motivational quotes or you know whatever. Um, there was a guy in our office who will remain unnamed, but he used to you know go out a lot during the week. You know, maybe on a Thursday night or something. Is this you? Yeah, no, it's not me. But <laughs> Today's also, a Thursday, by the way, <laughs> Sam. So, but he would he would go out on a Thursday night, and you know after maybe six months of this, he would put notes in his calendar, being like, you know, if you go out. And you come into work hungover. That's twenty percent of the week that yeah. you're throwing away. Yeah. So he'd have in the calendar. You can't be proactive. You know, every Thursday night he'd have in the calendar. Do not go out tonight. Mm. It's twenty percent of your week you're throwing away. So I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone's got something like that. But whatever works. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's wrap it up. Do you want to ask the final question? What is the final question? The re the regular final final question. The three truths. Okay. And we'll just do one, two, three. You got it. Okay. Um, okay. So. We weren't prepared for this one. <laughs> no, there's like, I mean, two questions on the on the sheet. So, uh, okay, so so years from now, imagine years from now, you live a very long and successful life, and you live to be well into your old age. You live to be 120, and uh, and for whatever reason, it's your last day. But your your friends and family and everybody who loves you, they're all around you. Um, but but again, for whatever reason. All of the podcasts you've ever done, all the books that you've written, the stories that you've told, it's all been erased. And the only thing that you, can, you have left is to write three short notes to the friends and family of the people who love you. What do you put for one of the items on that, on that note? Go ahead, Albertine. Like for life advice or just in it general? It could be about Anything. life. It could Anything. be about doing deals, Anything. whatever you oh, want. I think it would just be, you know... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, my first reaction was to say, like, you know, 
uh, people die, but legends don't, sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> wow, right. be that's a legend. But, but no, I mean, <laughs> yeah. honestly, I, I, that's tongue in cheek. I'm just joking around. I think I would just say something like in that context, like you live life, and then like unfortunately, we all have an expiry date. So may, do what you love and try there and live go. it to the fullest. There you go. Oh, do what you love. A little nicer version of what I meant, really meant to say. I like it. <laughs> I am still blanking. We'll, we'll go on to you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, drive fast and take chances. <laughs> oh, I like there. that. But it also, <laughs> right. I, Live know, life one mile at a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you want me to get deep, I, I think, you know, everyone's different and there are, you know, things are important to different people. And I think you want to, whether you're looking back or even looking ahead, you know, you, you don't want to look back on the past five years or, you know, past 90 and, and say, well, I did things that weren't important to me because... You know, you're going to look back and, and the things in life that are hard to do, I think, are the things you want to do. You know, you don't want to look back and say, well, I, you know, I half-assed it at work. You want to look back and say, well, I called 100 people a day that didn't want to hear from me. <laughs> and I, and I yeah, did it for 10 work. years, and now I'm, you know, just right. laughing. Um, I so think I as know. you get older, too, you see things from other people's perspectives in the industry and life, too, right? Talk about getting deep, Sam. <laughs> yeah, I don't fucking yeah. know, man. I, <laughs> 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 Yeah. You know, what do you got, Tom? Uh, I guess I'm going to rely on a quote or two, um, or I'll tell a story. There was uh, I was sitting at a table one time, and a, a girl had a tattoo on her arm that said, this too shall pass. And the person said, the person next to me said, well, that's kind of dark, you know, like it's, it's a sad tattoo. Mm. And she took it and flipped it the exact opposite way. And she said, this too shall pass. Any special moment you're having, mm-hmm. be aware that that's not going to be around forever. So soak up the good stuff and realize the bad stuff will pass too. Everything in life will pass. So I don't know. That was a weird thing that stands out in my mind that I think about every once in a while if I'm having a bad day or if I'm sitting there having a good time. Like, make sure you enjoy it. That's my inspirational yeah. quote. Beauty. Nice. I like Beautiful. that. Beautiful. David. Now. Yeah, no, not no. yet, David. I got, I got nothing, pal. <laughs> I got nothing. I'm used to asking the question. Oh, oh yeah, you on. gotta, you gotta hit us with one. We've all been honest. Yeah, um, you have so many people that we've talked to that have said so many things. Steal you someone else's. You're gonna use. <laughs> you're gonna be. Yeah. This too shall pass. Is gonna be on the next podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I was out one time and I saw this tattoo on this guy. <laughs> Just changed it a little bit. Again, it's your deathbed, so you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think I mean it's like a little bit of a version of of hang out with people that you love, but like I would I would kind of mix that with um you can you can hang you can hang out with so many people that you love and you can also hang out with uh like basically there's a ton of fantastic people in the world. So you just kind of have to seek them out and you can have a very like great life if that's what you're doing. And you've said this to me sometimes. Like you are Someone tell you what you can or cannot do. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. beat Sorry to your own drum. On behalf, but yeah, beat your own drum. I don't drum. know. I I agree. Uh, okay. Well, thanks so much. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. Maybe there will be a part two if you like it. Like it. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Like you very share much. Share this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>